Hi everyone, I'm Maureen Mills, welcome to our studio in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. My husband Steve Zoldek and I and our little dog Cobalt are uh, working this space. Today I'm going to um, work on some pieces that I made on Tuesday, but I'm going to start by throwing a similar kind of form again, and then I'll, I'll bring out one or two of those other forms and do a little bit of slip decorating as well. Uh, so if you, I don't know if you've um, been to our website yet, but um, slip uh, decorating is a, is a really important decorating technique for both Steve and I uh, doing traditional slip trailing techniques where work is, oh, that's what I need, a white slip trailing bottle, a uh, bottle with a nozzle to draw with, uh, and we also use sponge cut sponges. I'll show you about all those. Um, that might, that was, uh, uh, one of my other demos and, and then we're doing between, um, uh, here, this one, there's one here, uh, wood firing and firing in our gas kiln as well. So, uh, we're on YouTube live, of course, which means everybody can, uh, write questions to us. Steve is the director today, so, oh, thanks. Steve's the director today, so if you type a question, he will relay it to me, uh, and I will answer it. Keep in mind, there's probably about a minute's delay between when you actually see this and when I've actually said it, so uh, it'll take a second for us to get the comments and, and reply to them. But feel free to ask any questions. And... Um, this is obviously the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen's virtual fair today, uh, this week uh, through Sunday. You can, if you if you found us through our channel, you can go to nhcrafts.org to see the list of other demonstrating artists. You can make a donation to the league there as well. Usually, there's an admission fee to the fair, but not to the virtual fair. So, um, any way we can help, we will do our best. So I'm going to start with a making a textured form. Uh, I used to do um, I do I do a lot of throwing and decorating, but mostly the forms are decorated after they're thrown. Uh, you can't usually put your hands on a piece while you're while you're decorating it. But after I spent some time doing some hand building, doing slab work, hand building, I realized. That, oh, I could decorate those slabs while they were flat and do a lot of the decorating and then use, use those flat slabs to construct forms. And after I came back to working on the wheel again, I realized, oh, there was probably a way that I could incorporate that process into my wheel work as well. So I started um, experimenting with texturing the outside of a cylinder and then stretching it into a form. Um, so there are um, there are um, a number of vessels that I've made here that I will do decorating on and then stretch them into the rounder form. So these are, I kind of reference these as moon jars, which is a um, bit of a traditional, uh, mostly Korean kind of form, and a lot of contemporary potters reinterpret it. Um, it's a, usually a porcelain form with uh, clear, uh, sort of clear or white or celadon kind of glaze on it, and obviously like a moon, very round. Um, so there are a lot of reasons that potters like round forms. <laughs> um, the wheel goes around, of course, so that makes that kind of obvious. But when they're spherical as well, there's um, I've really um, been paying attention to people's responses to these forms, and there is something emotional I think that happens um, when people see these sort of um, spherical round forms. You make a make some other kind of connection with them, different than with uh, more angular forms, perhaps. And maybe it's because the earth, I've read all these things about the earth being round and 
you know, relationship to the moon and all that anyway. Um, but the round form, aside from those kind of connections and attractions, the round form is a very challenging form for a potter to make. There's a lot of opportunity for this to go wrong, as you might expect, and um, fine-tuning and making those curves uh, extra clean without, without well, I was going to say without any variations in the curve. You'll see when I put one of these back on the wheel, there's quite a bit of variation, and um, I don't necessarily need them to be perfect, perfect in every way, but... Uh, the physics of this requires there be some continuity in the line quality of the curve, especially the rounder it gets. Now, I'm just making this cylinder straight up and down right now. I'm using a, um, a firm tool on the outside that has a, a broad surface to help compress that uh, uh, surface. That'll, that'll help maintain some strength and integrity in the form as I stretch it, but it also um, gives me a nice surface, uh, some decoration. You're going to see me kind of muck it up in a minute with layers of texture, but still starting with that smooth surface uh, lets, lets that happen more, more easily and, uh, and deliberately. <laughs> I keep the surface moist. It's now wet under my hands so that the clay slides very e easily under my fingertips or under the tool as I'm decorating. And yeah, we'll just go with we'll go with that. So I've got um, a variety of these um, wooden tools that have been um, laser, laser carved with uh, different, different patterns and textures in them. And I'm, when I'm, I've made some and I've purchased some and I try and use them in, in unique ways to me. And I'm not, you'll, this is gonna look really sloppy as it starts, I think, but I'm really after adding a little bit extra texture in and letting this pattern uh, overlap and create some edges from where the tool starts and stops at different angles. And so I really do just sort of randomly start uh, applying this texture. It helps that the clay is wet. It helps that my tool is a little bit wet. And you, you can, I think you can see from the front camera how my, um, I'm just rocking it kind of around the, the piece. I thought I was making a, a neck on this vase when I first started, and then I decided that's not what I was going to do. So I'm texturing this all the way up to the top of this, um, of this cylinder. hope everybody's gotten to see some other uh, demonstrations and, and workshops this week. There, there's an incredible variety of live and recorded demonstrations going on on the, on the NH, nhcrafts.org website. I think once everybody got started doing it, we realized how much fun this is to, to spend a minute chatting with you like this and having you get to see our workspace and our demonstration space. Um, I'm gonna start now by, uh, I'm, I'm gonna help hopefully balance that rim just a little bit. You can see how bumpy that is, and I rather, I rather like when it's an irregular surface at the edge at the top. And you'll see how I, I, uh, I finish it a little bit later. I have, I have the, I don't know if you can see the one next to me, but it's down on the floor. Um, 
So now, obviously, I have texture on the outside of this, and a potter usually uses their fingers opposite each other to stretch the clay or to even shape and, uh, the piece, but I can't use my outside hand this time. So I'm going to work from the inside, covering, it, covering as soft an area as I can with my fingertips, pressing out slowly and gently from the bottom. Um, cylinder, uh, pots that are, are made are always built first by creating the cylinder height that's needed, or maybe sort of V-shape if you're making a bowl. Uh, but for something round, we start with a tall cylinder and put the curve in by stretching out from the inside and then bringing it back in from the outside. In this case, I'll just be lightening up on the pressure of the pushing out, and you'll see how that uh, this cylinder shape maintains and uh, will allow, allow this to, to keep a, a more spherical sort of shape. So I'm going to go fairly slowly, too. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot to stretch a piece uh, very round, and if the wheel is going too fast, that would, that would send, it, send it flying. I'm sure you've all seen that in one movie or another. So I'm pushing out and lifting up as I come back into this shoulder and I want the curve to come very much close to that upper edge. Um, so it's a little bit about balancing my the pressure here so I don't tip the cylinder over. There still is a center of gravity to be concerned about. And as I watch this curve as I'm shaping, I want to be careful to not push it too wide, too fast, or it might sit down on the wheel. It might give out the curve. You can probably see where my fingertips are anyway from this. On Tuesday when I was making one of these, our hour was ending and I thought, oh, I should be considerate to whoever the next dem demonstrators are and get offline. And I stopped, I stopped this doing the piece sort of before it was really done. And the shape was kind of bumpy and lumpy like this, uh, but I can go back in and with a different shape uh, rib tool, I can actually use, I can actually use the rib on the inside to help me stabilize those curves a little bit better than my, than my fingertips can. Oh, you might be able to see it already down towards the bottom here, where that curve is filling in a little bit. And I have to go slow and steady with the wheel. Potter's wheel can go pretty fast, actually, but I almost, I don't think I, I don't think when I'm throwing, I ever need it to go as fast as the wheel can go. And the, the closer you get to the end of making a piece of pottery to finishing the form, the slower your wheel needs to go, because obviously the wider it gets, physics has its way with clay often enough. And if the wheel were going too fast, it would, the clay is very fragile at this stage, and it would, it would really just tear it um, and send it flying over the edge, I think. Probably somebody might actually want to see, but I'm not going to do that. So I've done, this This piece is about seven pounds worth of clay. And I've done, last summer I did one of the biggest ones I ever did up at, up at our demonstration at, on the mountain. I, I did um, a 20 pound form like this. It was, it probably started about this tall on the wheel and ended about this tall as it got stretched out. And when I'm working that big, I actually use a propane torch to help in between stretching. This clay is, this clay is really wet right now so that it'll stretch this far, but when I'm doing those big forms, I really I can't can't support too much stretching. Can't support too much stretching 
um, until it sets up a little bit. And so that torch helps dry some of the steam, some of the moisture out of the, out of the, out of the piece so that I can continue to work on it. Feels like there's, might be a, no, no split. <laughs> so this is okay. This will be, this will be um, a good size that I'll be able to lift this off the wheel. Trying to get that, that shoulder angle lifted a little bit right here because it looked like it wanted to, might want to collapse. You might just have to let this one, let this one go for a while. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to kind of compress this rim a little bit to stabilize it. Whoa, whoa. So from the inner part of that rim, I'm turning it out just a little bit. So the wobble maybe is more on the outside. And I'm gonna, that might have to s stiffen up a little bit before I can go too far, too much farther on that edge. So you learn to, in the beginning, when you're learning how to make pottery and you're centering the clay, grabbing onto it, pushing on it evenly, as it turns to get it into the center of the wheel, you're always really concerned about getting it absolutely perfect. But as you progress and you realize, oh, maybe it doesn't have to be perfectly centered to, to continue to work with it. But um, because you can see there's a wobble in that, that means it's not, cent it's not quite centered in that spot right now. But it's going to be okay. Oh, there we go. That was just a little bit more adjustment. You're going to see in a second, I'm going to take this off the wheel. And I'm going to show you what I'm going to, what I do with them once they stiffen up just a little bit. I'm going to use this angled stick right underneath to bring that bottom, bottom edge in just a little bit. It'll make the whole piece feel a little bit more round and full. And it's I'm just below where the texture is. And I can always add that, add a little bit of texture back in once this comes off the wheel. All right, I think um, Steve is feeling slightly left out as the director, oh, I guess that's the producer, right? The producer screens the questions. The producer screens the questions and passes them on to the, to the radio host. <laughs> um, but you can ask questions and he'll relay them to me. Excuse me. All right, so we've got this set a little bit and I'm going to I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a place to put, I can think I'm gonna put it right up front. I'm gonna draw my thin wire under so I can lift this off the wheel. Sometimes I leave them on the boards that I'm making them on, but uh, this time I'm just not going to. Oh, very nice. There we go. So with clean, dry hands, I can pick that up from underneath. Round forms lift very nicely. Straight forms are obviously straight. There's not much to grab onto, and it kind of they can be kind of slippery. So, a round form comes back off the wheel. And that pattern that was started off kind of small is now stretched around around the surface of the pot. This is one I made the other day, and I finished the bottom just a little bit. And what I what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to put my I'm gonna put my de my decorating wheel up so I can raise this piece a little bit. I think you can still see that. And because what I what I want to show you it is possible 
is just because these pieces have come off the potter's wheel doesn't mean, oh, look at that big old, big old side there, just doesn't mean they're done necessarily. They can be, but these are pieces that are meant to have some movement to them. And uh, what I've discovered is that where there are some ir um, sort of irregularities maybe left by my finger or the, or the rim, I'd like to work those into the pot a little bit bit more by um, stretching. I put that rib on the inside and I'm going to stretch out a little bit where I see those areas that I want to fill in. The, the Adding that texture, adding the texture onto the cylinder when I started makes that cylinder a little bit thicker and a little bit thinner in different spots. So as I stretch the clay with my inside hand, it's not always um, evenly stretched uh, and even thickness in the end. And so uh, um, that leaves me a little bit uh, unbalanced while I'm, while I'm trying to stretch these on the wheel. And so this piece is at a, at a really perfect leather hard stage. You can see how stretchy it still is. but I'm not leaving any finger marks on it as my hand touches it either. So this is really quite, quite perfect for doing this. So the underneath the curve that's low under this piece here, this is where if it comes too round and full while it's wet on the wheel, that's very challenging to, to maintain, uh, maintain it upright on the wheel. So after it's this leather hard, I can actually go back in just a little bit and fill that, fill that curve in at that bottom place. I think maybe from that front camera, you can see a little bit of that stretching happening. So there are some mug designs that I do that um, the decorating technique actually leaves um, leaves the piece slightly distorted, and I've you know I've chosen to follow through with that technique, knowing that the piece is going to be slightly distorted from from exactly round, and that's uh, that's a conscious choice on on my part. I think when you see pieces that have deliberate intention of shaping like that. I think you know that when you see it, and uh, and it, and it works for the for the form rather than just um, being sloppy about shaping or whatever. How's that look? Thumbs up, thumbs down, clapping. You have emojis you can choose from. All right. I think that's actually, it's, it's, I, I don't mind there, I actually want there to be some uh, wobbliness, soft sort of gestural movement um, as I stretch this. And it may be that I can come back and stretch it again once more, even a little bit later. But what I, what I don't like is when there's a, a, a ridge that's very horizontal that um, oh, I keep seeing it right here though. This is, this, is my, this is my curse of fussing over things. I say, oh, I'll just go back one more second, one more time, I'll just do this a little bit. And then I'm, I, I sort of find, uh, find out that it was once too many times and then I've collapsed it. Although, I don't think this form can collapse right now. I think it's just right stage. I don't know if you can see that shoulder lifting as I do that. Really underneath there, stretching that shoulder up right there. Oh, I like that. See what I mean? I just can't, I can't help myself. I can't help myself. I think that, that feels, that feels really good. Um, so... What I wanted to show you today was um, a, a, how uh, some slip trailing, 
slip trailing technique happens that on our on Steve's work that's uh, covered an asymmetrical pattern across a bowl. Uh, some of the design is applied with a stamp and we, we both incorporate a very traditional technique called slip trailing. And slip is clay that's thinned down with water and traditionally it might have been in a clay box that had um, a hole or some sort of straw like a quill pushed through it or um, a funnel that was made out of clay that when you tipped it, the, fl the fluid slip might, might flow from it. So the, um, you can see on my hand, it le the tool leaves a particular kind of line quality. And um, in, in this country, you'll see that in uh, traditional mid-Atlantic mid Moravian earthenwares and um, before that landed here in England and Germany, uh, early stonewares and earthenwares were incorporated this to this technique to draw pictures or write names on a piece even um, and, uh, and to do design work. So the slip clay that's in this bottle is actually a white clay base. This is a white stoneware. I'm quite a fan of white on white design. Um, and so you'll, you'll see that, in, and especially in the wood, in the wood fired work. And so this is going to have, um, uh, I'm gonna just start, I'm gonna do it in, in front of me here so that I think, uh, I think both cameras might be able to catch this. Uh, so the slip has a, a thickness, a body to it that is just beautiful. And if I can control the speed at which I'm drawing the pattern, I can control the thick to thinness of that line. And in turn, just like the rest of the texture on these pieces will affect the glaze that goes over it, the thickness that, uh, the thick slip to the thin lines will also uh, affect how the glaze sits over it and uh, how, it res how it responds and pools. And then I get, we get a lot of variety in the glaze color Um, we get a lot of variety in the glaze color from, from using different, uh, not just different thicknesses of slip, but also different colors. This one is the white, like I said, this is a white slip. They get clogged a little bit, but we also use, um, uh, black and brown and some, uh, sometimes, uh, a, a red underglaze as well. So I think that's not, that doesn't look so straight to me anymore, but that's all right. It's handmade. And I'm doing it not like I usually would. I would usually do this sitting at the, at the table and, and on, on the side here in front of me, but I think this is uh, really helpful for everybody to see. And even um, a lot of, so there's a lot of texture on this piece already, uh, stretched from the clay, but the slip sitting on the surface and uh, some other techniques that I, that I use going in the surface also, uh, if I can find my, this is, these, I use a lot of clay stamps that I've made. This is just a small uh, square stamp that I'm particularly fond of, uh, partially because of its size, but partially because it's, um, it's a square and a circle together. And so when I pr press in, I don't know, you, can, you may or may not have seen that I put my hand inside to press against it. I just push on this. The wall of this piece is so thin right now, it's probably, it's probably well under a quarter inch thin because I've stretched it so far uh, when I made this piece. So right here where it's widest, it's obviously going to be the thinnest, I think. But so if I push against something inside, I can get that little square and the little circle uh, showing. And 
I will, I will be able to do this. Um, I'll be able to scatter this stamp around. I'm not using it to create um, even patterns. I, it's just a, a focal point and an accent uh, that you can see where, where after the firing, I usually embed um, a color of underglaze into that square. I've tried a lot of colors, but a little bit of red accent there is really what what pops that um, pops that the visual of that mark uh, showing after the after the slip is trailed. So there's a lot more drawing to go on that. This piece has to set up a little bit more. I will also use some wax resist uh, to mask an area. It's literally just room temperature wax to resist uh, anything that might happen on top of it. So I'm going to carve into that wax and then press something, another color in to make a contrasting design um, somewhere. I think I've got, um, there's some little sippers on our website that are done with that technique. You'll see a fine black line somewhere. You'll see the little red um, impression marks and you'll also see some some slip trailing. I, I like to do these little um, accent dots that the rest of the pattern is sort of scattered, but these little raised bits that come up, that show up very strongly underneath almost whatever glaze I put on them. And so I don't need those, I don't need these to be very big. I just want them, want that thickness of clay to show and be raised off the surface. Um, so I'll have impressed pattern into the surface, uh, basically under the surface. And there's this pattern that's rolled right onto the surface. There's slip pattern that's raised off the surface. And so when the glaze covers over the whole thing, the glaze is going to melt and pool a little bit into the impressions and around these textured areas. And, um, uh, and then it'll sit nice and cleanly on some of the other, um, well, there aren't too many resting areas for me. I like, I like a lot of pattern and technique and decoration, if you couldn't tell. Um, so th that's how, that's how these pieces come to come together. And I, I also wanted to show you, uh, some, some other slip decorating techniques that I've been using. Uh, these are these are also little pieces, little jars that I made on Tuesday, and they're mostly um, mostly ready for this. I might I'm not gonna be able to go quite as far as I might normally um, because this we're we're con trying to control the drying. It's humid out, and so either nothing dries or it's dry out and everything dries. So we control that drying by using uh, plastic uh, plastic cover. Um, so these are uh, sponge stamps that I cut by hand. This is like a foamy a foamy piece of sponge that I drew on with a marker and took a small scissors small pointed scissors with um, like an embroidery scissors, and just snipped away at this to get a pattern. And I like to use two different patterns where I can, uh, rather not two different patterns, well maybe two different patterns, <laughs> but what I meant to say was two different sizes. And I can use them combined or I can use them in all different ways to create pattern on this piece. And having two different sizes creates just a little bit more interest, uh, visual interest than if it was just one, just one pattern, one size. So I've got, um, this is actually uh, a black slip that I just stirred up. I start with my white slip base and, um, let's see if I can do that without spilling. Uh, I start with the white slip base and add a color into it. I can add a, an oxide like iron or cobalt to make a color. In this case, the black that I use is, uh, is a, uh, an underglaze stain. 
Sorry, my brain got my brain got paused because I need something to I need something to to tap tap that. This just gives me a little pad to, to tap. So when I gently rock that stamp around. It leaves the pattern. Of course, I was so busy talking, I actually used the wrong, I wanted to use the other size first. I know this, watch what happens. Watch what happens, this is live, live video, right? Oh, look at that. Oh. oh no, I made a mistake. And I didn't cry about it. How about that? All right. What I meant to do was use my larger sponge first. You'll see why in, in just a minute. So we're going to do that again. So these are all just cut by hand. There, there's nothing perfect about these or they're not, they're not matched up to be perfectly aligned and frankly um, I don't want them want these things to be perfectly aligned and I've discovered that I really like the little bit of texture that the stamp that the stamp leaves so we're going to start with that if you if you looked at some of this is actually I've been doing we've been doing stamp um, Stamp decorating for a long time. Steve incorporates a lot of stamp, sponge stamping with his, along with slip trailing. Uh, but I, I just uh, myself did sort of a new line of work with it that, uh, and I'll show you that in a, in a minute, that I really am enjoying because it, it adds to the, to the depth of all the, all the pattern making. And I, uh, I teach a lot of workshops on surface decorating and designing forms for surface techniques. And I, I pretty much always uh, say that if one technique is good, then uh, two techniques must be better. And um, you can extrapolate from there. Uh, I, I said in an, in an earlier video, maybe um, three, three to five techniques I do, and then I, in that, in that very demonstration, six things on the on the surface of the piece so now I've got some I've got a t little tub of white slip here and I'm, I'm afraid it I might have made it a little too thick for what I want to do but um, some of this is setting up a little bit and you can see it's a little bit of a wet sheen but I'm gonna stamp I'm gonna stamp some white slip over it I might have to do that again if this if this piece were slightly drier it would it would stamp a little more cleanly but the the black um the piece isn't isn't a nice stiff leather hard like that other textured piece was this is still a little bit damp and so the black slip isn't setting up as quickly as it might so i'm going to add a little i'm going to add a little of my water to that this is, this is how you do on the fly Just if it releases a little more thinly, then maybe that'll maybe that'll give us a little bit better visual. So I'm not concerned that these really line up perfectly because there are going to be so many more um, techniques going on, and in the end, they're going to have some some similarity to this pattern, where the fl floral bit of pattern is happening with layers of glaze and on these bowls as well. I don't know, there's white slip underneath and then a glaze put over and then a second glaze stamp to get, add, add a lot of texture and depth to that pattern. In. And that's what I'm hoping uh, will happen from, from this, uh, this technique as well. So I'm gonna try and Try and do a little bit more there. Hmm. 
wonder if they thought these would be a little bit more, seemed a little bit less humid today, but, and I thought I'd be, I thought I'd be good to go on these, but maybe it's just a little, a little humid still. So I, I uh, like I said, I'm really, I'm okay with this if it doesn't fully line up or look I'm going to do a little bit of scraffito drawing around around this now to add a little bit of that in-depth into the surface sort of design and that helps that helps with the glaze with the end result of the glaze to give a lot more a lot more variety I might just take a take a second Mm -hmm. I might usually have reached for, no, I'll use, we'll use the white right now. Remember on the last piece I did those, I did some little, little raised dots. Oh, I would, I would like those here as well. And it's really all about how the light catches these pieces and even without glaze and firing, you can see how the shadow is created, creates a bit of a focal point to have those raised raised little dots and scattered around the piece i think it it rather draws your eye from one spot to the one spot to the next and in the end well before the end uh, in my bowl demo i talked about a little bit about this can you see that there are Little, there's a little bit of a brown dot inside uh, near the center of each of these as well. And I, um, I could use brown slip, but what I actually like even better is using a brush and a little bit of raw iron oxide to dab right into the center of these flower uh, floral areas. And that's going to melt in with the glaze and have just a little bit more movement. Um, you could see it again on, on, this, on this vase form. To each of these, sometimes it's a little darker, sometimes it melts in, sometimes it runs a little more than others, and that's rather what I like about this technique is it's it's a little bit unpredictable, but we're using our our best best guesses and best intuition to uh, figure out what how we're going to get the best um, the best design that that we can that we can have. So I. I'm not going to show you that um, that biz, the bit with the brown because that comes after the piece is actually after the piece actually has some uh, glaze on it, and that's not going to be that's not going to be for a little while. We have to get a get a kill load together again before we start firing. So this will this piece will will have all these layers applied. I'll put the dots on it. And then it'll be set aside to dry. And when it's completely dry, that's when the bisque firing happens. That's the first firing to um, stiffen the clay up a little bit. It's still, it's fragile before it goes into that firing, but then the the bisque firing hardens that clay a little bit so it's less fragile and it's porous so that the, the, um, the glaze, well, the glaze is, is uh, powdered material stirred in with water so that porous bisque ware absorbs the water and draws a coating of glaze onto the surface. And glaze is essentially glass. It's a mixture of glass formers mined from the earth and um, as well as clay. Uh, if you've, we have, we have glass blowers, there are a number of glass blowing demonstrations that you can see this week. And they've got a big pot of glass that they gather on a, on a rod and, and they have to keep that moving because that glass is molten. Well, glaze 
would be the same kind of thing. If it were just glass, it would run right off the side of the piece. Uh, so potters use clay mixed with that glass, and the clay is refractory. That means it's going to hold its shape. So a combination of that um, is, go is going to make for different kinds of glaze. Whether If they're very shiny, they have a lot more glass in them. If they're very matte, like that vase form I showed you, they have a little less glass, glass in them. It's kind of like uh, making cookies. The more, uh, the more stuff you add to your cookie, like nuts and chips and raisins, the stiffer that cookie gets. And without that, they tend to, be, they tend to uh, spread just a little bit more. So it's a little bit like that. I'm always thinking about dessert, if, if I can help it. Um, I want to do a couple more of these, and then I'll... I can't... Um, I don't think I can do... Steve says everything about the kitchen sink, right? Oh, the, ki the kitchen sink cookies. Oh, I see. Um, I can't do all the other techniques on those other pieces because those that all happens in quite a lot in stages. So we'll, we'll just have to check in another time. But this is a new this is a new little new little form that I did from a previous previous demonstration I think and so um, but I, I like this little this little vase form okay there's one more thing one more thing I want to show you about this oh I can only do it with this right now okay this is just um, a potter's needle tool or it's a uh, just a thick a thick needle and I have another tool that I like to do sgraffito with, but this piece is too wet right now to do that. And I really want to show you this anyway. So I'm just going to, I'm going to do it with this needle tool. And I'm just going to very, very loosely draw around that, around the flower. I'm not tracing anything. I'm just sort of mimicking that, that shape as, as I move around the petals. So whether I, catch those the exact pattern of that slip is not really my concern so this tool is now carving into the into the clay through the slip and into the clay and that's going to affect how the glaze sits on sits and and uh, shows these patterns it's also going to help me see i hope when i put a coat of glaze over this i'm not going to be able to see the colors of slip so hopefully I can see this, the carved pattern, because I'm going to apply, I'm going to use those same sponges to use glaze to apply over the first layer of glaze that I, that I, that I'll put on this piece. So we're not having a firing for another, for at least two more months, I think, but you can check back on our, on our website. <laughs> oh, maybe these will go in the wood kiln. Oh, maybe they should go in the wood kiln. That'll be unloaded in November, no, October. So we'll have these up just in time for, just in time for the holiday. I know, it, I know I've missed, I've missed one or two over here. still have to do the do the little bit of scraffito on those scraffito uh, is that carving with the tool, the wire tool the needle tool that I was doing so I just wasn't sure I could get all the way down here I could pick the piece up and hold it in my hand and you can see a little bit of that too and you can see how wet that slip is we're demonstrating again on Saturday at 1 and go to our our YouTube channel Mills and Zoldak Potters 
and see all of these videos saved if you want to watch them again or share them with somebody. There are one or two other videos there as well, and I'll be um, making some mini videos that we'll share there along the way if you're interested in learning more um, making and decorating techniques. Uh, so on Saturday, I think uh, we think Steve is de demonstrating on Saturday. Uh, he likes to talk when he teaches just about as much as I do, so you're sure to learn a lot when, when he's on the wheel as well. We're hoping next year we'll be uh, in person at Sunapee and that we'll, we're anticipating having a demo, demonstration sales booth there where we have our work set up and we have a mini studio set up there as well. Uh, so I, I really love demonstrating at the fair because that the audience, who is you, um, is really interested in understanding about our processes as well as about our, our thought processes during uh, while we're working. And it's a perfect opportunity to be able to share those, share those things with you. And when I'm demonstrating at the fair, I, I'm actually always learning something new. Nearly every time I've tried a new technique or a whole new form that I've never even done before. And it's a great opportunity to, to experiment and, and share that uh, part of that process with everybody. Okay, so that's that. Perhaps I should just throw one more form as we round out our hour. I'm going to have a sip of water. Is anybody sending Steve any questions? Nobody's sending Steve any questions. You'll know this one when you see it next year because I just swiped one of the one of the patterns. That's my trademark. A bit of a swiped pattern. That's nice. I like that. So I usually throw it, there's a potter's wheel right behind me here, I usually throw standing up, except for some of the biggest forms that I, that I do, and these round forms come together very nicely if I can be over them a little bit, uh, because they start a little bit tall. So I'm just going to work on this piece and, and uh, tell you a little bit more about what I'm, what I'm doing. Somebody asked me the other day if I would explain more about some of the actual steps, like this is called, this is centering, but what do you do to make that happen? And uh, so that centering is me pushing down and in and pulling towards me to compress that clay. And if I'm, if I'm really lucky, um, that whole bit of clay moves up and I shift it back down. I'm trying to compress all the way into the center of this mound of clay. So that's why I keep working it in and out and up and down. I've prepared this clay by wedging it, which is a little bit like kneading bread. Um, but I, instead of putting air in, I'm actually trying to compress this ball of clay to take the air out. Uh, so my working it up and down really uh, kind of solidifies that that's, that that's happened. And it's, it's a lot harder to wedge a large piece of clay. So spending a little time doing that, um, doing the centering is, is important. So I, press down through the center to put that hole right in the middle there and making a floor across the bottom by dragging parallel to the wheel. And because this is a big piece of clay, I can grab with my thumbs and I'm pressing and squeezing in 
as I draw straight up from the wheel. I have to be careful that my elbows don't stay too far back. There's a center axis here, and that's if I, if I shift off of that axis, that's when everything goes kind of crazy wonky. So collaring that way and bringing that clay up the first, the first time like that leaves, leaves me a nice even cylinder to work with. And I am pressing the clay between my fingers as I draw up, coming straight up from the wheel in order to keep this cylinder coming tall. by pushing in a little bit at the base and I'm just going to move slowly up to try and keep this get the thickness just the way I want it I'm going to add texture like um, like on that other piece here and that happens at the before the piece is actually stretched into its final shape so I want to have a little bit of thicker wall Usually a potter wants to have a wall be very even, not necessarily super thin, but very even. And that's what contributes to the balance of a balance of a piece. So I know it's hard to hard to see that in a mug, perhaps when you're when you're shopping online. Um, but the way a handle sits on the curve and the way the body the body of the pot is shaped as well, sometimes you can get a nice idea for how how balanced they are. I have to say our mugs are often favorites for a lot of people, just to put that plug in. But if you're interested in if you're interested in seeing some of our finished work, our studio is in Portsmouth. You can call and make an appointment to come here. You can go to our website at sliptrail.com. That's going to be up past the fair as well. And you can go to the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen at nhcrafts.org to see more calendar of events, live events and craft events and recorded events. There's a lot going on. And if you want, if you want to and you're able to support the League, um, there's a place that you can make a, make a donation to. And that way we can ensure that we have a, we have a great fair next year, actually, in actuality on the mountain at Mount Sunaki. And uh, hopefully, I think there'll be, I think after this experience, for many of us, there'll be a, a video component, um, or not a video component, but a virtual component uh, often. So I hope you enjoyed that. Feel free to send us a message, like our channel, or subscribe to it if you'd like, and you'll get um, more information as we as it comes. Thanks again.